Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> okay, maybe uh, before we start, I always say that this is the most important slice because it will have the link to all the slides. So if, because uh, I will reference some other blogs and other more like research done by other people. So if you're interested to look into it, um, you can get the whole slide deck. You don't have to take pictures or anything like that. Um, so uh, also, um, yeah, it, this, this talk is quite relaxed, interactive. So when I ask you a question, you feel free to just shout out um, from your seat. I, uh, well, if it's a question, maybe wait until the end so we can give you a mic. But if it's just like a pop-up question, you can shout from your seat. It doesn't matter. Um, so let's get started. Sorry, are we ready? OK, <laughs> no worries. You see, you can shout, it's fine. <laughs> Yes, of course. Do you, is everybody okay? Just let me know if you haven't got the link, the slides. <laughs> right. Okay. We we go good. Ready? Buckle up. Okay. Good. So um, yeah, maybe I should read the title so give you more time. Um, bureaucracy versus uh, duocracy. So um, what is duocracy? Maybe it's a new term for you, and I'll explain a little bit. Um, but before that, I want to ask you a question. Who has been involved in an open source project? You can show me your hands. Yes, yes. most of you, all of you. OK, good. Um, so what's your role in it? You can, sorry? Managing, Managing. wow, that's a good role. Fundraising. What else? Huh? Fundraising. Uh, fundraising? Translation. A translation, wow, that's also a very important role. What else? Developer, Developer location. Oh, well, that's the first time I heard about it. <laughs> okay, cool. So um, yeah, we all kind of involved in open source project a little bit. So that's why we all care about how open source is, gov uh, is governance. But before that, I want to tell you that I also care about open source. I contribute to open source project um, in the past. I still uh, contribute in other forms. I uh, love organizing events. Uh, for example, that's one way of contributing. I'm also the, uh, the director and fellow of the Python Software Foundation. And right now, I work in the amazing uh, OpenSSF as the community manager. So what is OpenSSF? So uh, we are here because we are part of Linux Foundation. Yesterday, we just have our OpenSSF day. We have lots of um, folks to share the insight about uh, open source security. That's great. Um, so we have newsletter and blogs, which welcome everybody to sign up. We also have free courses. So if you're a developer, you care about security, then maybe check that out. So um, why open source governance is different? Why we talk about it kind of separately? We say, like, oh, you know, maybe for you, if you work in a company, if you have worked in a company before, you're kind of familiar with governance in a company, right? You say, like, oh, I have a boss, I have a manager. And they usually maybe they will have their boss. And then at the end, maybe there will be CEO or the owner of the company or you know, the, the board uh, of directors or like this. Like, I think it's not alien for people about how maybe a company work. But open source is different. Um, so I compare open source with proprietary software, which is usually like a software that is commercial that's offered by a company. So, um, you know, so proprietary owned by uh, an individual, sometimes just one person, um, or a business, or sometimes it's an organization. It's very hard to tell, like because if they are not making a profit, then they are just an organization. Um, but open source, <laughs> so what is open source? Open source, like sometimes you know, we have project that may be started by one person or a group of people, um, but well, they they kind of the owner of the project, but maybe time evolves, like maybe they you know, transfer a project to another ownership, or they are like, okay, maybe they kind of, because the project's too big, they take a step back, they don't write every single line of code of that project. Uh, there will be people who uh, contribute. Sometimes there's like uh, some community member contribute a lot to um, that, you know, software. Then who really actually own that software, right? Mm. And uh, for open source, uh, a lot of work, like I said, is done by volunteer. Is uh, so it's like we can't say that you know um, that okay, we're like the owners write all the code. 
Um, but for a proprietary software, since it's like own my business, usually like they will hire staff to write it. So when you hire staff, you probably will have an employment contract that like all the code that they write for the, in the work time is actually belongs to the company. So well, th that's why there's also the clear ownership. Um, so these will be the engineers who work for the company, who is not volunteer, they got pay. Um, otherwise, nobody's gonna, you know, do free work. Um, so, uh, in open source, there are some, some kind of hierarchy. You sometimes, uh, most of the time, you'll have like some people, they will have the right access to the repos, or they will be sometimes called maintainer, or the owner, or actually they're the leader, oh, sorry, <laughs> the leader of, of that project. Um, but it's not really rigid because uh, it depends on each project. They may have different governance. Uh, for the bigger project, they may have uh, maybe have a steering council, which is a group of people who make the ultimate decision for the project. But for some smaller project, maybe just like they only have one maintainer, and that person will be, you know, in charge of everything, so they can say yes or no to everything. Um, for proprietary software, you know, it's a company. So like I said before, everybody kind of like understand the hierarchy of a company. It's very clear. You know, you know who is your boss. <laughs> you know, like who is actually making all the decisions for the company, right? So that's actually very clear. Um, for open source, there's less commitment because they're all volunteers. They can come and go when, you know, when they have time, they can contribute when they're busy with other aspects of their life. They could take a pause. They could you know, just take some time off without actually applying the time off. But if you are staff, if you work, you know, you know you're writing code for proprietary software, then um, because you're hired, uh, you have commitments that you have agree with that company. So it's a constant responsibility. So if you want to take time off, you have to apply for it. Um, you can't just like, okay, I'm busy. I'm not going to do this now. You can't just like, oh, I want to take a month off because I am a bit Busy, so <laughs> you can't do that. So um, yeah, so that, that's a different kind of um, structure here. Um, so open source, a lot of time is user driven. So uh, a lot of time, how a project evolves depend on a user who may actually be contributor themselves. There may be forums that people discuss. Oh, actually, I wish this feature could be uh, implemented. Then it will be much easier for my use case. Um, then people may agree or disagree, or they have other opinion or stuff, or can you know they have discussion. Um, for proprietary software, it's mainly profit-driven. User also have a say by not buying <laughs> the, you know, the software or stopping the subscription. But at the end of the day, how a proprietary software a company made the decision of what to do or what not to do, they would think about, oh, whether people will like it and spend money on it. So that is profit-driven. So um, now let's talk about Miriam. Uh, miracle, um, how it kind of applies in open source. So um, I look it up because English is not my first language. So I, I was like, okay, miracle. I heard it a lot. I kind of know what it is, but let's, let's consult a dictionary online. So I look it up um, and it said that, oh, it's actually a governance followed by the power of people selected according to merit. So I guess this is uh, coming up because it's a um, kind of a uh, reflection of, uh, for example, like uh, hierarchy, uh, um, which is, you know, oh, if you, let's say, if you're born a royal, then you have the power, right? Or um, let's say, for example, again, like comparing open source to a um, kind of a company, commercial company kind of structure, uh, who is leading the company will be maybe the owner or maybe the owner, they hire a CEO who make all the decisions. So that's not really people are elected them to do it, right? Miracles is more like kind of like, for example, like how a government work, um, you know, we have elections. Um, so you can choose um, who is leading um, the government or something like that. So, um, so that's actually a uh, kind of, you know, a, uh, born out of, oh, we want something different, so we have miracle instead. So, um, yeah, so that's like, uh, and also there's a line here, which I will quote again later, is, um, you know, everyone with skills and imagination can aspire to reach the highest <laughs> level. So that's the example of miracle like, okay, um, yeah, so everybody can be the leader if you are good. So that's basically what it means. Um, so, in open source, there's a lot of cases that miraculously is applied. 
I would say this is like the rise of the BDFL. So um, imagine now we'll be back like maybe 20, 30 years back in history, back in time, um, when uh, open source is a new thing. So there are like very smart developers that they are, um, that they was like, oh, I don't want to be told what to do by the owner of the company who may not know what's the best for that software. So um, yeah, so maybe they will start their own creating own software and then that's come from there. And uh, BDFL, who, who, who haven't heard of this term, BDFL? Oh, okay, that's good. So what is BDFL? So BDFL is in short for uh, Benevolent Dictator for Life. When I heard about that term, I was like, it's a bit oxymoron, isn't it? Like, how can you be a dictator and benevolent? So I was like, mm. um, But actually, they, uh, well, they choose this term because uh, it used to describe a small number of open source software uh, development leaders who, uh, who actually they have created something, maybe usually at the beginning with very less help. So they basically like a one man band or one person band that own the project. Um, but then they give it open source, give it to everybody to use. So that's why there's like this dictator and benevolent kind of contradiction there. But actually, it's not a contradiction. It's describing how this leadership in open source works. So this small number of people who started something that uh, something that maybe become quite big this day, and everybody uses. And um, because it's open source, it's a free gift for everybody. So that's why they also get this benevolent title here. Can you name a few of them? <laughs> Anyone? 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 Maybe you have seen one this morning. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So um, yeah. So Linus, of course, like uh, he created Linux, which everybody uses, everybody loves. So uh, I, I would say that he's a benevolent dictator. Well, he's maybe he's not like dictating now, but uh, but he did actually create something that is amazing and everybody uses. Um, so this term, like. Is like it's more emphasis on highlighting the excellence contribution to the open source system, and uh, where lots of developers are inspired by them, they may want to oh, I want to create an open source project that's used by many people. I was one of those people that oh maybe I can create, but I'm too far from it right now. But um, I I was actually when I was just like learning all this like coding and stuff, I was inspired that oh. It's so cool. Everybody can create something and share with people. And maybe I can create something and share with people. And you know, um, that's that's the inspiration. Um, but when I look at it online or like do some research, it's very hard to find um, women or people of color who who bear this title. That like, um, I, in my point of view, I have um, met a lot of amazing. Um, you know, women or people of color or people who are not like your generic um, programmer type that I, I, th I think I am inspired by them. I think that I learn a lot from them. I, you know, I want to be like them, but um, they are not like, you know, commonly known as a BDFL. So, um, so, so that's, that's, um, that's the difference here then. I feel a little bit, you know, that's why I also feel that, oh, I'm very hard from that goal. <laughs> and like, I'm very, very far away from that goal because, because, you know, I am a woman. And so hmm, maybe it's, it's very hard for me to, to, to reach that. Um, in bureaucracy, um, so what we do is that, uh, so I, this is how I sum it up myself, right? Uh, we believe in elites. We think that, oh, who is good can lead us to a better place, right? We trust them. They are the best people because we elect them, right? We choose them. So we trust them that they will do the best for us. They know how to do the best for us. And we think that they are the, you know, you're just out of us. We just choose who, who is the best. They can be the leader, right? Um, so again, like I quote again, and everyone with the skills and imagination may aspire to reach the highest level. So it seems like everybody can get a chance to be there, right? You just have to be good. You just have to be good, then you can be a BDFL or someone who is um, the best and leading the whole community. Um, but is everybody given the same resources and opportunity to reach that level? It's, it's a thing that I reflect on uh, a lot of times. Um, because, like I said, why there isn't a lot of BDFL that looks like me, a lot of them that doesn't look like me? So, 
Um, so I want to tell you a story about my friend Marlene here. I put her face here. She's like so, you know, happy, and you know, I, I feel a lot inspired by her. So she is uh, uh, she's from Zimbabwe. She's a software engineer, and she is also the previous director and the vice chair of the Python Software Foundation. So it's kind of like you know, uh, she is kind of my senpai. You know, <laughs> she, she was the the, the director um, of the Python Software Foundation. Um, she founded uh, a symbol pie, uh, which is a nonprofit that helps Zimbabwean women uh, in tech, especially young women. So, oh, by the way, I use a lot of uh, women as an example in my presentation. Uh, it's an example. It also, I hope the general kind of, um, you know, reasons also apply for other underrepresented groups. Um, but because I'm a woman, I relate to, you know, being a woman. So that's why I use them as an example. But if you, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying that it's limited to women. So I just want to clarify that up front. So, um, so why I tell you about Mylin? So, um, uh, months ago, she uh, gave a keynote at PyCon Italy. And uh, in, in PyCon Italy, uh, so after a keynote, uh, we should talk about diversity and inclusion. I, I really enjoyed that keynote, it's, it's really good. Um, but then uh, a male Italian, well, I, I tell from his accent, but you know, uh, but I hope, hope I get that right. Um, I am not like, you know, kind of, oh, you speak Italian, that's why you're Italian. But uh, maybe he's a male Italian developer. Uh, he asked, oh, I don't see how we are different, right? So he's talking to Mylene. That, I don't see how we're different. I, in, he said that in his eyes, he see them as equal. And so why, you know, we have to put effort in uh, diversity and inclusion um, in it. So, um, so for me, like, I remember I was sitting at the front with a few friends. Uh, we are all like kind of women in the community and we were all like, you know, <laughs> crutching our fists. It's like, wow, this is a really challenging question. And, you know, and, and so it's, it, it, deep down inside us, it makes us feel a little bit angry. But we can't, I can't tell you why, but like, I feel a little bit angry, but I can't tell why. But Mylene gave a really good answer. And it kind of diffused the bomb. It explains everything very clearly. It kind of... You know, this uneasiness in us, like she kind of explained very well out there. So this is what she said, um, not exactly her quote, but I'm trying to summarize. So uh, she said that uh, we are not given the same access to resources. So she said that when she was young, um, she don't have an access to a computer. She only start having like, you know, you know, kind of, uh, you know, using po uh, using computer and do some programming when she was studying, um, do, you know, in university when she was twenty. Um, so, so she said, compared to you, she did not grow up in an uh, environment that was su supporting her career as a software developer. So at that time, I was like, suddenly I realized that oh, actually I was the lucky one because. I was lucky that my dad is a computer geek, <laughs> and so we have computer at home. So when I was young, while well, all my classmates doesn't have a computer at home, I do have a computer. So I was the lucky one compared to my Lynn. I also think that, oh, yes, actually, you know, that's the difference. That's how we can't assume everybody get the same chance to, to, to be good, right? Um, we are not on the same level playing field. I think a lot of times um, when I explain to people, so some, some people sometimes like, you know, I feel like everybody can be an ally. It's just that they need to understand, you know, because, you know, how to let them understand and step into our shoes and see, oh, how a woman in the tech community feels. Um, sometimes, you know, you just need time to explain on that. Um, so... It's not about one's ability. It's not like so. Maybe that question from that Italian developer, like he's on a on a good good like good intention, saying like, oh, I don't see that ability-wise, we are different, right? But um, there are differences on other aspects. For example, social expectation. Um, so, for example, again, like I, I well, I was lucky in some aspect, but I was also like a, a girl who grew up in Hong Kong, uh, in the East Asian culture. So in my culture, when I grew up, it's like girls are not encouraged to study, you know, STEM subjects, science, engineering, computer science, those are boys' subjects. So, um, 
so yeah, a social expectation. Nobody inspire you to become a developer. No one inspire you to, you know, um, to to be good at that um, that field. Um, also, access to resources. I'm one of the lucky ones, but I can imagine, for example, my classmate who may be from a family that like maybe not uh, having a very high income. They would have very um, you know, uh, they don't have access to a computer at home. So at that time, I remember there's like the, uh, the government trying to um, improve the, you know, computer literacy of the general public. So you can go to a library and use a computer, but that's very limited. You know, th those computers tend to be very dated. So, um, so imagine that if you grow up, the only way for you to play games or, you know, is to either during the computer class or go to a library. So that's very limiting um, compared to someone who is like as lucky as me that like, you know, your family got a computer at home, you can access it whenever your parents give you permission, um, so which is very convenient. Um, so we are not giving the same opportunity. So even nowadays, I'm talking about, for example, I'm talking about when I was young, which is like 20 years ago, 20 some years ago, um, giving out my age now. But um, even nowadays, if you think about some countries, they may actually still, you know, when I do some workshops in, the, uh, in an African country, sometimes they will bring a very dated laptop they may have to share with someone because they don't have one. So, um, so imagine it's still a problem nowadays that not everyone were given the same opportunity to have access to all this technology and things like that. So, so bureaucracy, it seems like you say that, oh, you don't have to be born in a royal family to have the power. You just have to get good and then you'll be the leader. But it's still not saying that everybody is equal. Everybody is you know, having the same opportunity. So we have something else work. So recently I learned a term um, from my colleague that, oh, there's something called bureaucracy. What is it? It's like a funny name, right? It's like you stick two words together. Like, okay, let's have a look. Um, so, bureaucracy means that it's an organization structure that um, each person will choose their role. Basically, they put their hands up and volunteer themselves and say, I can do it, I would do it. And then they got to do it. Nobody will say, oh, no, no, no. Like, we have to make sure that you are the best person for that job. You know, uh, it's not worked that way. Um, so an example in this blog post, that again, I found this definition from somewhere, is the com community wiki. So if you're interested, you can have a look later. So they use an example of like a group of friends, a, uh, actually quite big group of friends are going for camping. So someone um, put their hands up in the mailing list, say, oh, let's cook together and I will organize everything. So she did. Um, but then if a new person joined and he's being a bit, or he or she being a bit, rude and say like, oh, but why she decided, she got to say like, decide on what we eat and why we do it this way, why we all cook together and do this. And well, because she is the only person who volunteered herself to arrange the, um, the meal <laughs> for everybody. Nobody else say a thing or volunteer themselves Maybe someone, you know, if you are in that group, you can be like, oh, actually, I want dessert. Maybe I'll provide dessert. Then you got to choose the dessert, right? So whoever put their hands up and volunteered themselves got to do it. Like nobody say like, oh, for example, you you offer to bring some cake. Nobody say, wait a second, I don't know if your cake is good. You know, no one, no one, nobody say that. So that's the bureaucracy, um, you know, uh, governance or community model. Um, so now, bureaucracy, right? Um, you don't have to reach the highest level. We don't have to prove that you're the best person to arrange the food or make the cake or, you know, so we just let you do it. <laughs> um, everybody give them a chance. So maybe you're in charge of the cake, then maybe I can in charge of something else. Maybe I can in charge of like, oh, I could um, make some salad. I don't know. So, you know, if you want to do it, then nobody's stopping you. you you're given the chance to do it. There's no gatekeeping. You know, you don't have to do a taste test before we let you to prepare the cake or salad or anything for everybody. Um, is it good? So is that, is that a thing that we can use to, you know, remove all these like inequality and bias in the bureaucracy model? Let's look deeper into it. Um, I would say the open source is kind of bureaucracy. It's not absolute bureaucracy because there is always a a case that you would come across, then you think, mm, yeah, I, I, I still haven't get the trust from the community, so I can't do it. There is the case like that, but 
open source, it's always some work to work, more work to work on. So a lot of open source projects, you can see how many issues they have in their GitHub, GitHub or whatever repo, that it's always some more work. Even if it's not there, then if you offer your help, if you talk to someone, they may be like, oh, I think you can help this. I think you can help that. So there's always something to work on. Um, or if, let's say, you suggest this new feature and the, the community was like, mm, no, we are not sure, we are not going to um, pull that in and stuff. Well, you can derive your own project. You can make a clone and then like, OK, I think that feature is essential, so I would make a clone at that feature and see if people are using mine. You know, it's kind of like, if you want to do it, you can do it. Nobody's stopping you to clone it. Um, and um, less gatekeeping. There's still some gatekeeping. Like I said, sometimes, like for example, uh, you want to implement a new feature, you need to get the consensus, the agreement from the maintainer, from the user. You know, there's still some gate. But compared to a proprietary software, which if you want to change a proprietary software, you either need to apply for a job in that company who over that software, or you have to write a business proposal to convince the owner of that uh, of of the project to you know adopt. Uh, your idea. So it's less gatekeeping. But is open source open to women? So this is a question that I have in my mind and, oops, sorry, I, I, I have it in my mind and I think about it a lot and I saw a very good like analysis of it here um, in this. So this is, again, it's a blog post. Um, there's a link there. Um, so uh, what they do is that they do a little bit of statistical analysis. They do it on GitHub. Um, it may not, so take it with a grain of salt because not everything is on GitHub. Not every contribution to open source is on GitHub. So, but, well, GitHub is a popular place to put your project, so it's kind of like a general um, reflection of how it is. Um, so the result it is only 5.4% uh, of the GitHub user uh, who have over 10 contribution uh, from the random sample are female. So what they do is that they use a tool to check the profile of the, uh, of the user. So maybe they kind of check their social media to see if they put a pronoun, whatever. I don't know how it works, but you can dig into it. But they're using a tool to check, like to identify whether that user is a male or female or, 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 or other gender. Um, so that's what they do. It's only 5.4% only and they count it. Um, there's, and other number, I think it's around six for all the users who made a contribution, but this is like over 10 contributions. So anybody, I would say anybody make over 10 contributions are active contributors. So only 5.4% active contributor for any open source are female. So according to this study. Um, so wow, it's alarmingly low rate. <laughs> um, so inside the article also uh, mentioned one thing, which uh, I also resonate a lot, is that amount of women who join the tech industry, 56% uh, leave for mid-career, which is double the tuition weight for men. So imagine if you uh, look at the industry, right? The more senior you go, the less women there will be because there's more women leaving um, than men. Um, that's one woman that uh, I will mention later that she also um, kind of uh, take a break from her career. But I, I can I can tell you her story later. Um, but um, I want to tell you about the Python core devs uh, because again, like I, you know, I, I my my background is in Python, so I'm very familiar with the community, and um, so I think that I would tell you an example that I'm familiar with, but it's not limited to Python. So Python core devs, who are the Python core devs? So they are defined as developers who have commit rights to the Python um, project, C Python project itself, which is the standard distributor of Python interpreter um, on GitHub. So who have the commit rights to that project? There are eight women in it. Do you know how many out of eight? Like how, how many, like out of how many there are eight? Any guess? No idea? Out of 87 active ones, so these are only the active ones. There's, I think, there's 120 something in the whole history of Python core devs. <laughs> so it's less than 10 percent. Well, it's better than the 5.5.4, uh, but still very, very low number. Um, why? I again, I was when I just started in the Python community, I was in, inspired to be a Python, you know, core dev. But then I was like, oh, look at the numbers. It's very hard. It's very hard for me. Um, 
But the community is a bureaucracy community. Um, whenever I try to offer some help, um, there's always something to do. People will be like, oh, you can do this, you can do that. You know, um, there's a lot of issues. <laughs> you know, if you look at Python, there's a lot of issues. Um, but when it comes to technical leadership, there's still a few women. Um, uh, yeah, if you look at the number, I don't have to explain more on that. So why is there so few female core devs? Um, so what is lacking here? Um, I noticed this because like we always, uh, when, I, when we organize events, there's always like a panel that we invite some core devs. So it's like, we always like, we don't want it to be an all male panel, but it's very hard, you know, because of this. Um, so uh, meet Marietta, this is my friend. Uh, Marietta is the first female Python core dev. So wow, one out of that age, and she's the first. Um, and she's also the Python chair of 2023, 2024. She has 10 years, uh, 10 plus years experience in tech. So she's, you know, in terms of merit, she's very high, right? She's highly technical, also lots of contribution to the community. So I ask her why there are few uh, female core devs out there. So I keep waking you up with my mic, sorry. <laughs> also, there are a few points she mentioned. Um, so uh, I, uh, so maybe if you well if you are women in tech then maybe you resonate if you're not maybe talk to someone who uh, identifies as women in, uh, in in tech. So a woman has to work very hard in a job to get um, recognition uh, compared to their male peers. Um, so like Lena said this morning, if you want to be you know achieving something in open source, you have to spend long and committed time for a contribution that is. It, that could be outside of your job, um, because lots, a lot of company will let you, you know, spend time in your work hours to contribute to open source projects. So this is extremely hard when you have to sometimes maybe work extra hours uh, in your job, and then you have to work on top of that for open source project. It's even harder when you have family. So Marietta, she got two kids. So I was like, how can you manage? I don't know. <laughs> um, so and how did factor is that there are COC enforcement there, the code of conduct enforcement, make sure that it's a safe environment, but still microaggression still happened. Um, those are instances that are very hard to report. It may be just like a attitude that is not very nice, um, that you know, it, it, it doesn't make you feel very welcoming, um, but still it's not an absolute thing that you could report, so that's still a problem there. Um, so what went wrong with DNI effort? Nowadays, a lot of tech communities put effort in DNI, um, but but why? Why is we still have problem? Why we we are like still having this microaggression, or maybe oh why there's still a few women in there? Um, anybody heard of this one? This tweet. Sorry, it's a bit small, but it's about a conference that has been discovered by this, um, I follow, uh, he's a tech reporter, I follow him on t uh, Twitter or X, whatever. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's a tech conference that he discovered. Uh, they, they don't do CFPs, they don't do cover proposals, they only invite speakers. And out of the three women that they invite, actually two of them are not actual person. Um, that's what this uh, journalist discovered. So, what are the problem here? Why people need to fake, you know, fake female speaker profile? It's the first time I've like heard of that. Um, is it because like for some company or organization, they think that diversity and inclusion is just a slogan, right? Or oh, nowadays, if you don't put like diversity and inclusion in there, you would get canceled. Or if you have like a or like this white male speaker lineup, then you'll be caught out, you know, you'll be boycott, you know. Is it like that they're just, oh, we have to do it because we got the pressure? Or they just like try to make the numbers look spreader. Um, I suspect it's a thing that happened a lot in a lot of company when they write their report, diversity and inclusion report, they try to up the number, they try to maybe include some non-tech roles, uh, employee us, you know, oh, we have a lot of female in our company, or uh, we have a lot of like, you know, non-male in our company, or um, so it's just, they, they would just want to make the number looks good, but actually, for example, let's say, oh, they, they don't do all this thing, um, it's like how many non-male um, developer out there, but that counts all levels, so, you know, like I said, maybe the more senior you go, the less um, women or less like a non-male developer there will be. Um, 
this I heard a lot. Uh, I've talked to some organizers, like, why you can't find female keynote speaker? And they would say, like, well, I mean, we choose keynote speaker, uh, you know, for their merit. So uh, we just can't find in, enough women. There's not enough women out there that we think they have enough merit. Which, again, like, I, I got angry sometimes when I heard this. This is excuse. This is like, you, you see the problem, but you are just trying to, you know, not solve the problem and, you know, just use it as an excuse to let your, um, let it slide. They're just avoiding the fact. They're just trying to, like, you know, um, ignore. They don't even ask for help, which is also, like, again, make me angry. It's like, talk to me. I can try to help you, you know? Um, what can we do? We have to acknowledge the problem. We don't like, you know, oh, this picture, by the way, this picture is uh, a, you know, I don't know if you know, because like, I grew up in Hong Kong, this is what we say when you, or there's a thief trying to steal the bell. So it's like, oh, if I touch the bell, it will ring. So I cover my ear so I don't hear it, so it will be fine. So, okay, so it's kind of like that, right? It's like, well, avoiding the problem, I pretend that it's not there. So uh, acknowledge the problem is the first step. So it's the first step that we have to do it. We don't avoid it, we acknowledge it. We understand it. Um, how to understand? Talk to underrepresented folks. So lots of times, like I again, like I, I'm a woman. I can only resonate with the problem women are facing. But then maybe, for example, if I want to know someone, let's say someone with a disability, how like how tough they are. I don't know. I have to talk to them and like be honest and be humble and ask them how we can help you, how we can make it better for you, right? Um, effort to work on it. Again, like. It's, it's an investment. You don't know, like, the return doesn't come immediately. You know, I have organized conference that we provide childcare. Nobody was using it. We provide, like, human speech-to-text translation to help uh, maybe folks who can't hear or, like, or, or can't understand English or to help. But um, you have to keep working on it, even though you don't see the results immediately. Um, continue. Constant effort. It, you know, you can't just like try it once, mm, it doesn't work, let's give up, you know. No, you have to keep doing it. We go from a conference that like nobody used the childcare, we just provide it, to now we have to book extra childcare because everybody's bringing the whole family there, they bring their kids, they bring their spouse, so the spouse can learn about tech and wow, that's amazing. So we have to keep on doing that. Um, support those efforts. So um, if you, uh, you know, you can um, support, you can, for example, financial support, you know, those accessibility um, things are not cheap. So financial support is a good support, um, but other support is also welcome as well, volunteer or, you know, anything. Um, so I would call that supercracy model. So support, I put the ocracy at the end, so supercracy model. So this is the model that I made up. I think we have to provide opportunity and support that underrepresented groups need to be successful in leadership and community. We can't just say like, oh, come on, just get good, you'll be there. Or like, oh, spend some time in it, just you know, volunteer yourself. You have time, right? You have time. Not everybody have the same amount of time they, they can spare. So especially for underrepresented groups, we have to give them support if we want a diverse community. So this, again, is a picture I found from a blog post. They mention all the things that we have been doing or maybe we haven't been doing, but we can think of doing, for example, like code of conduct um, or empathize the, the group. Uh, for example, we have the diversity lunch that we just had um, for the uh, women and non-binary folks. Um, so that is like uh, promote awareness of the presence of peers. So that's like one of the things that we have been doing it here. Um, so there's also a lot of other things. Some of them we are doing, some of them we can do better, some of them we can now start doing it. So um, you can have a deeper look in it. Last, I want to introduce you to this woman, um, Buana. She is uh, Indian. Um, she actually was a former outreach intern for, she's a former outreach uh, intern for Apache Airflow. So um, outreach is an internship program that they pay, they get funding and they pay to uh, uh, pay these underrepresented um, folks to be working in, um, in open source projects. So she's still now, even though her intern finished, she's still an active contributor to Airflow, and that actually helped her to restart her career as a software engineer. She stopped her um, career because 
she feels that she is not catching up with her husband's career, even though they're both, they were both um, software engineers. So she, at some point, she took a break. But Aurichi uh, and Apache for this project helped her to restart her career. So um, kudos to that. And you know, if you, you know, so this is a few points that I want to tell you to take home because I'm running out of time. So. Not everybody has the same access to resources. Remember that we have to acknowledge that and remember that. Pay developers in open source, not just the maintainers in all levels. Like Aurichi, pay some interns so they get the chance to learn and to be good. Um, to provide education for those who have less access. Um, sometimes you have to um, give them to uh, folks in other countries, maybe. Um, emphasize the success, put them on my presentation like this, and provide a safe environment, code of conduct for them. So um, last thing, what shall we do? Maybe try hypocrisy. Maybe that's the way to do it. So thank you very much uh, for this presentation. This is our last chance to grab the slides. So thank you. <laughs>